There's an interesting thing, just riffing off what Gilles had been saying. The first thing he was talking about with regards to globalization, or not the first thing, but one of the things that always sticks in my mind is this idea of competition. And I can understand, and you, you can probably understand, people not turning up for other people's, other colleagues' talks who they're in competition with. But the idea of not turning up for your own talk <laughs> is taking it to another level, really. Then there's this idea of consumption. Perhaps some of you were thinking that uh, I had um, gone to Al Stewart last night, consumed some good jazz, and maybe consumed too much uh, alcohol or uh, with it, and that wasn't, that wasn't the case. Uh, but luckily, we were saved by the global, globalization of communication. Uh, when I wasn't here, and it was interesting, the different styles of, um, uh, of Lawrence, and Cecile and Claire, and then also Rob, uh, contacting me by text, email, uh, and voice message uh, to tell me <laughs> that I, was, I had been communicated old information. This is a wonderful thing about, um, uh, this is a wonderful thing about communication in uh, the internet and the, you can, you actually, it's, was it version 2.1 or version 2.2 or 2.3 or 2.4? But, the information I picked up two days ago was already old. <laughs> and I was programmed because I'd given up having a brain and just do everything by BlackBerry. And I was 4 till 4.30 in the BlackBerry. I've got to be here. So when I didn't have to wake up my wife at 10 o'clock to be here, I didn't. And so that's a long-winded way of saying I'm really sorry uh, for uh, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, you, anybody who was here for the last two days probably knows that the question that I had in the back of my mind with regards to this idea of global mental health and cultural psychiatry was really uh, an idea of um, why don't we all agree? Because everybody really wants the same thing. And so I'm going to be talking about uh, three things. One is just to set up, and you've already had uh, You've already had uh, Vikram talking about global mental health. You've already had uh, Derek talking about why global health is wrong. Um, so we'll talk about global mental health. Then I want to talk a little bit about the impact of globalization on mental health, and then just talk a little bit about how you get agreement. So taken from uh, the 2007 and 2011 Lancet series, uh, I have, am I in the right place? <laughs> see, uh, yeah, you see, now, now I'm getting really the right place and right time is the sort of in the back of my mind. So as soon as he comes down, I was thinking, well, you know, now I'm actually in the wrong place. And so, um, so the mission, uh, paraphrased, is this idea of improving access to mental health care, uh, reducing inequalities in mental health outcomes. But, uh, between and within nations. And it's this idea of scaling up. Most people don't get care. How do we scale up to make sure that people get care? And it's been implemented in a number of ways. The Lancet series in 2007 maybe was the thing that started it all off, kicked it all off. Then there's a mental health gap action program. The movement for global mental health uh, down in, uh, uh, based in Melbourne. And then recently grand challenges in global mental health and other initiatives, something new every day. So one of the pieces of work uh, I was uh, involved in with uh, one of our psychologists, Sean Kitt, is he was asking the question uh, about how people who set up um, services, community-based services, in, uh, sort of survive. And he looked across a number of marginalized groups and services that had been built up in the community for the marginalized groups and looked at things that had been there five, ten years. And he wanted to know how they survived. What were those ingredients of uh, this social entrepreneurs' uh, movements that moved forward? And there were four things that came out, four common things. One was the idea of the leaders having a personal investment with the social justice framework. The second was close integration with communities. The third was clarity and stability of the values and focus while still cultivating flexibility, but then nimble enough for some rapid implementation. And then the last one was creating social capital. And the interesting thing about this framework 
was rather than people wanting to produce widgets or produce things or produce blackberries, the aim of social entrepreneurs was to produce social capital, produce something better, produce a better world. And I think that um, this is things that are common, and when you look at what the global mental health movement has been doing, it's quite difficult not to believe that they fall into this framework, and therefore they're likely to be a group that are going to succeed and are going to last, because these are the um, uh, characteristics of successful social entrepreneurs. So they're going to be around. The critiques are the critiques you've all heard. Now, some of these critiques are not critiques of global mental health. They're critiques of psychiatry in general. And um, the medicalization of suffering, the development of diagnosis and treatments have not been democratic, the fact that there's no real consensus on treatment approaches, and there's a question of evidence. Which evidence? What evidence? Whose evidence? How you produce evidence? And so there are non-specific critiques. Then there are these specific critiques of global mental health per se. And some of those are about the accommodation of differences in illness, in illness models between groups. And some of those are the fact that there's no real strategy for articulating or dealing with the power and financial imbalances between high income and low income countries. There's a question about whether some local ways of being get squashed out by the hegemony of uh, sort of this global juggernaut. And then there are questions about whether this is really colonization of ideas uh, and a globalization of mental illness. So these are some of the specific critiques. Not all of the specific critiques, but some of the specific critiques. And the criticism partly comes because when you have an opposing views, um, people find themselves somewhere in this sort of nexus. So generally, everybody thinks from their own worldview that they know what the problem is and they've got the right solution. And that's where they think they are in the sweet spot. And they think that opponents either have the wrong problem with a great solution, or the right problem with the wrong solution, or they're just plain wrong. <laughs> Wrong, wrong, wrong. Wrong problem, wrong solution, irrelevant. Yeah? And that's how we get into this disagreement. And uh, sort of the, the theory of sort of how you produce agreement is partly about defining problems and partly about defining solutions, but also about understanding that we all have in part, uh, parts of us that, uh, are looking at the wrong problem with the wrong solution, and we populate all of those all the time. It's really a matter of degree than a matter of absolute. So one of the things I was thinking about when I was thinking sort of there are lots of problems and there are lots of solutions and global mental health is undoubtedly the right solution for a particular problem and cultural psychiatry is undoubtedly the right solution for a particular problem was have we got all of the problems on the table? And I started thinking about globalization. And I was thinking, well, what if part of the problem is globalization? And, um, you know, therefore, what, what would that mean? How would we think about it? And I, I started looking a bit about globalization, and it became so big that I decided I needed to do a, something a bit smaller because it was just too big a concept. Um, other people like uh, Harry Minnis or uh, Dennis Bugra or Lawrence Kermeyer have got bigger brains and therefore have been able to really think of the whole uh, nexus of globalization and the impacts it has on identity, the impacts it has on uh, mental health, on the structure of family. But I thought that probably uh, after this slide I'd move into something more very specific about globalization and see whether we could think about what that means about uh, sort of the problem of globalization. Because when you get something that impacts every part of life, you eventually get to the idea that globalization not only changes the way we do things, not only changes who we are, not only changes um, some of the material aspects of life, but it's actually something that changes the cognitive fabric of life. And so all of the 
changes we see in globalization sort of move off from that. Uh, and if you think of uh, the etiology or the development of things having at least four dimensions, sort of things that happen to the individual, uh, things that happen on an e ecological level, the interaction between those things that happen to the individual and the ecological level, and then time, you can see that you get into a very complex etiological matrix, especially when time is something to do with the different histories of different groups, and that there's a different chronology to the sort of uh, anthropology or the history or the travel or the direction of movement to different peoples, different types of ideas and different uh, developments over time. And um, you know, we know that globalization interacts the in individual. We know that there's identity formation or change in the exposure to risk. We can look ecologically at societal structures, values, family structure. Um, demographics, migration, the development of knowledge and the communication of knowledge. We can look at an interaction between the individual and the ecological and then, we, as I said, we could look at time. So by now, usually people are saying, what's he talking about? <laughs> yeah. Now, that might not be the case in this audience here, um, but uh, people say what you're talking about. So let's look at one, one little bit of globalization. One of the things that globalization has brought with it is rapid urbanization. Um, the percentage increase um, is greater in low-income countries than it is in high-income countries. And by 2030, 90% of urban dwellers are going to be in low-income countries. That's what's happening. This is one of the big issues in global mental health, urbanization. Urbanization brings a challenge to government. On the one side, government want to need to make cities more hospi hospitable venues for economic development because that's what this sort of urbanization is about but on the other side they know that there's going to be a push to make that social environment more suitable for people and there's a bit of a, um, a challenge there for government now we know that the urban environment itself though the research is uh, variable isn't that good for your mental health? So we know that um, high rates of depression, psychotic disorders, substance misuse. Um, we know that um, the uh, studies for depression and the studies for psychosis are probably the best. Uh, in the past, we used to talk about drift. We'd talk about social drift into cities. And it wasn't cities themselves. It was the social drift into cities of people who had high risks of mental health problems that probably increase the risk. And that stuff came out in the 30s from the Chicago group. But most of the work at the moment shows that it's not drift at all. Certainly for psychosis, it is being born and brought up in a city that increases your risk. Actually, for psychosis, the biggest risk factor for developing schizophrenia is being born and brought up in a city. That's the biggest uh, single identifiable risk factor. The longer you live in the city when you're young, the higher your risk for developing <coughs> psychosis. So there's something about city life that isn't good for people. Um, some people say it's just uh, changing your exposure to risk because actually people haven't really deconstructed the city. And that could be to malnutrition during infection, it could be to drug use, it could be to life events and chronic daily hassles, it could be due to social um, isolation. But some people have found that cities actually change the action of particular risk factors. So if you look at the clustering of schizophrenia, of people with schizophrenia in deprived areas, that really only happens in urban environments. And the genetic vulnerability to schizophrenia is amplified in cities. Um, it may be that cities are more stressful. Uh, it may be that social structures, social, social networks are not as active in cities. But then the conundrum is that cities actually uh, allow us to have these sorts of meetings and allow me to get from the hotel to here in 10 minutes um, uh, when, uh, with no breakfast. And, no. Um, uh, when, uh, when, when there's um, uh, when, when, when in a crisis. So there are good things about cities. 
There are good things about cities. But rapid urbanisation has three other dimensions. This I dimension of migration, and we know there are impacts of migration on mental illness. Um, this impact of rapid socio-cultural change. And um, I don't know whether Vikram was talking this morning about the situation in India and the rates of suicide in India, but I was very taken by his work, which seems to show that in areas of the most rapid socio-cultural change in India, suicide rates are peaking. And the same thing happened post the, uh, Soviet, the um, Berlin Wall coming down in the Soviet Union. So there's this rapid socio-cultural change. And then these new environments in cities produce new risks. I don't need to talk about this slide, actually. We all know that migration can be broken down into pre-migration, migration, and post-migration. And we know that currently, in, uh, if you were in the UK, uh, the post-migration setting is one of the most important things for the development of mental health problems in, in migrants. And uh, it's uh, with uh, great shame that in Canada at the moment, we are making the post-migration uh, situation for refugees worse and worse and worse by taking away uh, their rights and entitlements to health. This rapid social change which comes with rapid urbanization um, has individual, community, so we're now talking about the individual and the community again. So just when you're looking at rapid urban change, we're talking about identity, we're talking about anime, not knowing how things work. We're talking about family strain and breakdown. We're talking about competition for resources, which is increasingly happening in urban situations, uh, and social exclusion of marginalized groups, and then inadequate community support. Um, these, most people are not moving into nice cities. They're moving into shanty towns. They're moving into slums. They're living, moving into places with poor educational uh, uh, with poor access to education, poor access to clean water, poor access to the rule of law and government. That's the, what's happening with regards to uh, rapid urbanization. And this is a particular problem according to the World Bank. So if you look at the percentage <coughs> of the urban population living in slums and you look at the actual numbers that we're talking about, we're talking about huge populations, huge urban slum dwelling populations worldwide. And this is one of the problems that uh, we have been encountering in uh, our new globalized world. So you could say that we're producing a perfect storm. Problems due to migration, problems due to rapid sociocultural change, and the development of toxic slum urban environments, which are bound to have impacts on people's mental health. Now, we know uh, from a positive perspective that people are incredibly resilient. We know that there'll be new ways of living. There'll be new ways of coping with um, uh, these adversities, and we don't know exactly where it's going to go. But our guess is that for all of the positives that are going to come, there are going to be a number of people who are going to find this process difficult. And if I'm right in saying, and I hope I haven't uh, got the information wrong, it's not necessarily just the poor in, uh, who are suffering from rapid urbanization and rapid sociocultural change. So, if this is typical, of the type of problem. This is just one of the many problems of globalization. If this is typical of how complex the problem is, then the question I would have <coughs> is whether the mission that uh, the uh, global mental health has meets the problem. Whether producing services is an answer to the problem. And you, you know that from where I started, I think that uh, global mental health and the production and the scaling up of services is the right thing to do for mental illness. The question I have is whether 
we need to also be thinking, and I know that they will also be thinking, but I'm just wondering whether in our minds we need to increase the prominence of what we do about global mental health, truly looking at health rather than illness, and looking at prevention and promotion rather than um, treating illness. This slide, just like the information I had on when I was supposed to be here, is old. We had a two-day uh, uh, great uh, sort of meeting, and in that meeting when people were talking about things, this slide was changed. The actual uh, numbers of things that people agreed on when you looked at cultural psychiatry or global <coughs> mental health or people in the room in general increased. The number of things that people didn't find agreement with also increased. But the interesting thing was that the fundamentals are completely in place. It's one of these things where everybody sort of agrees. And it's a question about whether we're getting to the point where everybody sort of agrees on the problem <coughs> and what we're really having discussion about is what the solution should be. And the interesting thing about uh, global branding is global branding is all about <coughs> one solution because one solution makes one person a lot of money as opposed to lots of solutions and plurality uh, that actually therefore meet the needs of various people. And with, within the umbrella as articulated of global mental health, variability is one of the things that's welcomed. Um, but it's not what um, uh, people have seen or understood from the branding. Basically, if we agree and this is taking it to a slightly different letter level. Five minutes? Good. Um, uh, because I will be on time. If globalisation, uh, for the first time, if uh, globalisation impacts mental health, if it impacts rates of mental illness, if it impacts even the way we think about uh, mental illness, and if it, if it impacts the way we respond to mental illness through changing this cognitive fabric of our lives, and if one of the things that happens in global processes is an increased standardization of the way we think about things. We were talking the other day about the number of languages that are disappearing. <coughs> languages are disappearing because people are going to standard languages. They're going to standard languages so they can communicate with, the people, with each other in a global world. And so this standardization is a standardization of a way of thinking about things, a way of doing things. Uh, and that standardization can feel threatening. So if we agree that that is one, some of the stuff that's happening in globalization, then you can understand that the development, the very development of the notion or the idea of global mental health could be seen as part of the globalization process. Uh, it could be resisted by some who, uh, as, as part of that, because even though people talk about plurality, they worry that plurality will not be uh, part of what's happened. Part of that is that the way you manage to get things done in a global society seems to be uh, by using or the languages and the tools and the processes that um, uh, people understand with this new global fabric of society. Um, and that comes with it. With, with with it comes a whole sort of value base or a perceived value base, um, even if it's not a held value base, a perceived value base that makes people worry. So if the problem's multi-level, dynamic and complex, um, then some of the problem is in what we think as opposed to what people say, what isn't said, how things are done uh, are important and uh, the structure, the very structure of the idea and the movement becomes very important because if it looks like a globalization process, then people see sort of a number of the uh, sort of uh, characters and idioms of a globalization process, which is things that people will always trigger people into resistance. And, you know, the thing that happened, as far as I can see, with a pragmatic global mental health uh, was that um, there's not been a clear articulation of the scope of the problem that everybody agrees in. Uh, 
though everybody does actually agree on what the scope of the problem is. It hasn't been articulated. And there was a decision about where to start, but it didn't feel like that was something that everybody agreed with, though it has to be done. You have to start somewhere in order to get movement forward. Uh, but the process and the process of consensus, and I think yesterday Gilles was talking about the fact that uh, he worries about consensus because uh, some of the ingenuity is in a controversy. And controversy and consensus, uh, in his mind, uh, one of the things that we need to think about. Um, and I think it, it is. We need to think about con consensus and controversy because um, globalization, in my mind, is partly about building consensus and moving forward. And controversy is partly around trying to get it right. And I don't believe in trade-offs. I think trade-offs are wasteful. I think that trade-offs possibly are a way of finding new ways of doing things that move us forward. But um, to believe that controversy or consensus are um, opposite sides of the poles that you can't reconcile, uh, in my mind, it makes me feel uncomfortable because I think the triumph of humanity is finding <coughs> different poles than finding some other way of moving forward and using the power of those different poles to do something else and to produce a new reality. And I think that's how we move on as, uh, as, uh, as people and as a, a, a human race. So, <coughs> trade-offs. We have stereotypes, and one of the things, uh, Alex Cohen's in the room, and yet the thing I saw with Alex over the last two days is he kept on saying, your idea of me is not who I am. Your idea of the global mental health movement is not who we are. And being in Quebec, I was sitting there thinking, well, the interesting thing here is it sounded like what happens when English people go to France and speak English. Yeah? The French might understand or might pretend or might not understand, but you're not going to get anywhere. So the, in the frustration, what people tend to do or people tended to do in England is they thought that if they spoke English slowly and loudly, <laughs> then the French were bound to understand. <coughs> right? And if the slow, loud didn't work, you could throw your hands around. <laughs> but that would work. And what I heard, and uh, other people said afterwards, was that it wasn't necessarily, it is that people were not speaking the same language. And when they were speaking the same language, they weren't hearing the same language. And we got into a situation where we had perceived stereotypes which did not reflect the diversity in the room and we produced a cleavage which didn't actually really reflect the diversity in the room. And we actually produced a trade-off which didn't need, to be ex didn't, didn't need to exist at all. Yeah. There is not really any need for a trade-off because when we actually looked at the list of agreement and the looked of disagree a li list of dis disagreement, there were people <laughs> from different camps sitting in agreement and disagreement all over the place, and the sort of the polar polarity started to go away. So this is the last slide, and I don't have to read it because I've run out of time. But really, I don't think the problem's global mental health. I don't really think the problem's cultural psychiatry. I think the problem is that we need to produce a way of more people being healthy and more people who need services getting services. So the problem from, for our position is how to think of the science of articulating our philosophies, our values and what we want to do and how to think about getting to agreement so we can move forward to deliver for the people who really need it. And I think that's where the science is. The science is how we actually think through these things and how we work through these things to move forward. And there are loads and loads of ways of doing this. There's huge amounts of uh, 
uh, work on the management of disagreement and the building of effective, um, of effective interventions. And I just wonder if that's the science that um, we possibly need to be thinking about if we're going to do something that makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you.